Okay, it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Rosalba Parna today uh, with us. And uh, is, uh, Professor Parna is a is a theoretical astrophysicist with broad research interests. She holds a PhD in physics from Harvard, and also a music degree in piano from the Conservatory of Music of Potenza, Italy. She was recently hired. Uh, she was hired at Stony Brook from uh, CU Boulder, and prior to that, she. She was a Lyman Spitzer Fellow at Princeton and a junior fellow at Harvard University. So it's a pleasure to have Rosalba Parna here, and she's going to talk about binary compact object mergers in the gravitational wave. So Rosalba, it's, uh, the floor is okay. yours. Uh, thank you very much for having me with you, although uh, only virtually. Uh, so the topic of uh, my talk will be on uh, on um, merger compact object, as I um, already mentioned, and uh, it, with a particular emphasis to the era that we are in, which is one of gravitational waves. It's been uh, uh, very, very exciting for, uh, for us astrophysicists um, in the last uh, three, four years uh, since the first uh, detection in, uh, in 2015. Uh, but also, um, in addition to the gravitational waves, um, there has been, we are actually in, in an era where um, there has been the connection between gravitational waves um, and uh, electromagnetic uh, signature, electromagnetic uh, <clears throat> radiation. So in some ways, this has been also uh, what we call the beginning of multi-messenger astronomy, which has been very popular in the in the astrophysics uh, world. And so some of this talk will be focused on gravitational waves, but also highlighting some, you know, just it will be a very tiny bit because many talks one could be giving just on this, on this topic. Um, but what we can learn uh, when we combine uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, observations with that of gravitational waves. So I will start uh, with, um, with an introduction <laughs> and let me see why this doesn't go forward. All right, <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, so this is the outline. So first uh, I will be talking about compact objects in a nutshell. Uh, so introducing what compact objects are. Second, I will be uh, describing what gravitation waves are. And again, in a nutshell, just, um, just a very quick um, introduction. And then uh, we'll go to the actual topic, which is um, gravitational waves from compact object mergers and the associated electromagnetic signatures. And please feel free to interrupt me at, at any time. Um, I made it very introductory <laughs> to both uh, these topics. So if I don't get to the more technical parts later, it's um, uh, no problem at all. So I'm happy to uh, at least um, spend as much time as needed on uh, on the introductory um, introductory part. Okay, so let's uh, so let's start uh, therefore with uh, introducing what compact objects are. And in order to introduce compact objects, we need to take one step back. So compact objects are objects <laughs> which come from the depth of massive stars. So in order to um, understand that a little bit, here is a snapshot um, of, li of that life and um, so actually birth <laughs> to start with life and that of stars. So let's start by going over uh, this, um, this uh, mini intro so that we can get to compact objects and understanding a little bit more where they're coming from. So first of all, so we said they are coming from massive stars. So where are stars coming from? Uh, stars are coming from uh, the uh, collapse of um, clouds of gas in the interstellar medium. So every so often, um, some regions become more dense than their surrounding. And there are certain conditions that are very fine, where basically gravity um, exceeds the pressure uh, of the gas, the thermal pressure of the gas, and this cloud will start collapsing. As it collapses, it will um, get hotter. It's basically conversion of um, gravitational energy into thermal energy. And the center um, of, this, um, of this cloud of gas will get hotter and hotter and hotter. Now, now where does that stop? And here is the first uh, the marking line um, that we see on this uh, four line uh, tracks. So the first demarcation line, as you see here, it's this uh, is in between um, a number which is 
a, a below 0.08 solar masses. Just as a reference, astronomers tend to use the mass of the sun as a reference. So I will be doing that. <laughs> and there is a symbol that they have coined uh, that they use, uh, which is an M with a, a dot, um, like a circle with a dot. So this, I'll be using that uh, here and there in the following so that you know what it is. It's just a convenient reference um, since the sun is our star. So for masses of gas, they start below 0.08 solar masses. The core you know, gets hotter and hotter. This is, you know, happens in, in every case, but it does not get to a high enough temperature for um, uh, fusion to ignite in the core. So what happens to this object is something that gets, you know, denser and denser and denser, hotter and hotter, hotter until a certain point. And the point is when electron degeneracy pressure will start stopping the collapse. These objects are called the brown dwarfs. So you can think of those as failed stars, if you wish. Um, so they're basically objects that become sort of so solids, uh, so to speak, but never shine. And then they'll just spend the rest of their life cooling uh, forever. So this is uh, so these are non stars, uh, although everything starts in the same uh, way from collapsing clouds. Now above that minimum threshold, the core uh, as you know as the cloud collapses is able to reach a temperature which is high enough for fusion uh, of hydrogen most um, interstellar medium is made of um, of hydrogen it's the most abundant gas as you know uh, so the in the core hydrogen will start fusing into helium um, so those temperature are uh, around 10 to the 7 kelvin or so so this is when fusion starts uh, this uh, this is the object becomes self-sustained. Uh, so as you know, will uh, it produces uh, fusion pro releases energy, and that is basically what makes a, a star to shine. And this is also what when a cloud, what used to be just a cloud of gas, uh, makes its transition to a star. So that's how a star is born. Now, once a star is born, we have still three three more paths to follow here. So there is this lower mass path, and this is in mass as we go from smaller to uh, higher masses here, uh, as I'm uh, pointing out here with the, um, uh, with the mouse. Um, so this uh, branch here is a branch of one solar mass. So this is the fate, this is our, our own sun, <laughs> what will happen to it uh, with time. So uh, what happens is that um, burns hel uh, hydrogen into the um, into helium in the core, but then at some point hydrogen is exhausted, so it's all helium core. At the point the core will start collapsing. As the core collapses, it gets hotter. This is the same principle again that uh, collapsing objects get hotter simply by energy conservation. As the core gets hotter, helium will start burning. What's the burning into will become carbon oxygen. At the point, however, once it's, uh, it basically forms carbon oxygen, the core has a size uh, which is below 1.4 solar masses. It's a very uh, important number in this low mass uh, in this low mass star stars. So the core um, the core once uh, helium uh, once carbon oxygen is a, is um, once every the core is all carbon oxygen will start again collapses collapsing, but uh, there is um, again. <laughs> the same happening uh, once again, it cannot reach a temperature at which uh, it's hot enough to, to set in for uh, burning of carbon and oxygen, because before that happens, electron degeneracy again sets in and stops the collapse. So the end state of a star like our own is that of a core that becomes an object, a carbon oxygen, uh, basic carbon oxygen, solid object that we call white dwarf. And then the outer layer, they get hotter because this white dwarf is very is very hot. And also there are previous phases during the star evolution when, um, uh, when um, a lot of energy is, as the core collapses, a lot of heat is transferred to the outer layers. So basically what happens to this star is that ends up as a core. So white dwarf core, it's again, it's carbon oxygen 
object uh, below one solar 1.4 solar masses. It's a Chandrasekhar limit. It's a very important limit that won the Nobel Prize actually to Chandrasekhar. Um, and um, it's it's the it's the, actually the maximum mass physically. It's the maximum mass at which electron degeneracy pressure can hold an object together against further collapse. So below for these masses, the core is below 1.4 solar masses. And then the outer parts are basically diffuse gas. This is the outer envelope of the star that will diffuse into the interstellar medium with time. So this is the fate of our own sun, if you ever wonder. Uh, so there, will be, there won't be anything dramatic uh, to happen. It will be still in a number of billion years from now. So we uh, can live, uh, we have much bigger problems right now to worry about, uh, but this is where, uh, where it will be. So, okay, so this, that. Now we go to the uh, two higher branches, which are the ones, um, if not of interest for our solar system, they're of interest for LIGO and gravitational waves. So these are stars with masses above seven or eight solar masses. The exact boundary um, depends on models of stellar evolution and metallicity and so forth, but roughly uh, around that order. So below that, we, again, we have the, this path, the white dwarf path. Uh, above that, uh, what happens? So what happens is that the core uh, wants its carbon oxygen. So up to a certain point, everything proceeds as similar, but because it's more massive, electron degeneracy pressure is not able to stop the collapse. Um, and therefore there's further collapse, higher temperature, and basically higher, um, higher level, uh, higher burning. So uh, carbon oxygen is able to keep on burning. And basically, uh, as you can already guess, uh, the whole process continues with uh, a series of burning to higher uh, elements in the periodic table, and then collapse and then burning and collapse until the core becomes iron. As you know, iron um, cannot uh, sustain any more um, uh, fusion because it becomes the it, it's it's a it's a stable element, so we'll need energy in order to uh, to burn. And therefore, at that point, the only thing that can happen to the core is that of a catastrophic collapse. Now, what happens next to this core? It's again depending on the mass of the star, which will be reflected on the mass of the core. And here again, there is another separation in mass, which is somewhere um, between like 20, 30 solar masses, uh, 30 more. It's again, it's it's not exactly well known. Um, it's it's a few tens uh, because it, it depends on a lot of details of, his, of stellar evolution, as you can imagine. But somewhere in that order, around you know, say 20, 30 solar masses. So the core will reflect. Um, so the core of these more massive stars will be also more massive. And basically, the, the bottom line uh, will be a dramatic difference in the outcome here. Um, and, um, and it is the, um, as the star um, reaches the, uh, so as the core becomes, uh, again, iron, in both cases, uh, the star goes off as, uh, with a dramatic ex explosion, with the, again, with the core collapsing. And we'll see more in the next couple of slides on this. Uh, so this is just a uh, diagram right now. Um, and the outer layers being ejected into space. So let's see a little bit more of the details of this end state here, because they're very important in, uh, in, uh, in the universe. Uh, so explosive events. So this is um, how the compact objects are um, produced. And again, it, this is the other, there are the two last uh, more massive branches of stars. This is what we are looking at. So this is like a star in a cross section uh, as it's about to, uh, to collapse. Uh, it's, uh, it, it looks like an onion. Um, you can imagine, uh, you can imagine of it um, as uh, where every, um, every shell here, it's uh, a layer of material, uh, which is uh, burning. So the, when the core is iron here, we have because of the temperature, um, you know, temperature being hotter in the center and being um, uh, declining <laughs> towards the outer layers. Basically, they are burning layers of in, of increasingly heavier elements as we go from uh, the top to the bottom. So we basically have the old periodic table, and this will come back in a moment as a side uh, issue of very much importance uh, for us. 
Um, so let's follow this. So it's again um, some re restating some of what I said already before. So the, this is the core, which is collapsing, collapsing and becoming um, a compact object. So that will be either a neutron star or black hole. And again, we'll go back to that specific more later. And during the process, there is, you know, as the envelope of the star is collapsing, uh, it also suffers a rebound. So there's some of that rebound as it impinges on the um, on the core, which is very hard <laughs> at the point. Uh, but also a lot of neutrinos are being produced. Um, and even the neutrinos are in extremely um, small cross sections. However, the densities in the outer envelopes of the star are so high that even neutrinos actually it can are able to interact quite um, substantially and hence transfer a lot of, um, of momentum to the, um, to the outer envelope of the star. So we have this interesting situation, which is the core collapsing and the outer envelope ejecting into space with the huge velocities. These are velocity of um, tens of, of thousands of kilometers per second. The phenomenology that uh, we see, it's uh, what we call a supernova. So it's probably a name that you may have heard before. And this is uh, an example. It's a, a real one uh, from, um, um, it's actually, it, it, it may as well be the most famous supernova uh, that astronomers uh, have seen because it's a very, it's a very recent one, as you see, 1987. And, um, it also appeared, it, it happened uh, relatively nearby. So when it's, when uh, these stars, these massive stars explode, so that's the moment when a compact object is being created. So when these stars explode, um, they, um, they have a luminosity, which is like billions of times the luminosity of the sun. So just to put it in, uh, in um, <laughs> you know, in perspective, how bright, uh, how major these events are. So this was, a, a very lucky uh, case where the region of space had been imaged by a telescope, but just you know people have been looking for other things. Uh, so the star that is you know that which then exploded, which is right here, had been seen um, uh, before the explosion, and then it went off as uh, as an explosion and has been studied in a lot of detail. Um, so this is just to give you a sense of uh, um, that. You know. I have a, I have a uh, yeah, please question. go ahead. So yeah. Yeah, so it, it, when you start from a nebula where there is an inhomogeneous density of all this matter, so in the sense that, so is there a distribution of all the objects? So you mentioned like 0.5 solar mass, for 10 solar mass and all that. So do you get a whole continuum distribution of these objects? Or <laughs> yeah, continuum? you're asking a super interesting question uh, because it's, uh, so basically, so the way it happens, um, so the answer is yes, how exactly uh, is, it's one of the subjects of, uh, you know, which people have been working forever. Uh, so the, the distribution that we see, so there is, you know, the, the answer which is observational, <laughs> Um, and basically there is, uh, as we call IMF, in interstellar. Um, so it's the, the, the distribution, um, um, initial mass distribution of stars. Uh, and it's basically M to the power minus three half. So there is actually, um, that is a low for, so there is a distribution with many more smaller ones. Um, now theorists are trying, have been trying to, you know, one of the area which is, you know, star formation. Uh, so theorists have been trying to, to, to simulate that uh, in computer simulations. So basically the fact that, you know, there are more smaller objects, um, it actually does, they do find that uh, because what happens is that when there are um, these homogeneities, so you start with, you know, let's say a larger cloud that's collapsing, but there are these homogeneities inside. So that results into smaller clumps within the bigger clump. Um, but then, yeah, the size distribution, uh, it is, uh, so, you know, the, the theory is still not quite uh, exactly matching it. Um, but yeah, the answer is that, yes, so, so there is a continuum masses uh, and it's one of the um, quantities that astronomers are after. <laughs> but, uh, you know, observation is an interesting number because, you know, it's being an input, um, you know, into a lot of calculations. You want to know how many of these stars are. And when you were calculate also the rates for LIGO, that's an input, you know, how many stars we have. Yeah. With masses so in the range, that most of them are failed stars, in, according to their distribution. Mostly are, small, are smaller stars, so m to the minus three point five. So they're mostly are small stars. Hmm. Okay. 
So they're right. It's uh, it's 3.5 or 2.5. So Peter, now I am having a moment of uh, if uh, I think it's 3.5, but to, the, to be double checked, it's called saltpeter initial mass function, and it is the most uh, most uh, well used one. I don't remember if I <clears throat> remember the integral or or the DM uh, uh, um, but the the the, the, the either way, it's um, so there are many more smaller objects. Um, which is common in, in, you know, in a lot of situations in astrophysics where you're forming, um, you know, bigger, smaller objects in interactive environments. So the smaller ones, you know, also for planets, we have a lot of asteroids, you know, everything started from, you know, from small objects um, <clears throat> assembling together. And, you know, there's a, a lot more of the smaller ones than the bigger ones. Um, but the bigger ones are the ones that are interested for uh, for us. And there's plenty <laughs> of those, uh, anyways, uh, in uh, in uh, um, in the universe. Um, actually, as an aside, I wanted to mention since again, it, it's a, it, it may or may not be uh, such a known fact, but it's a very interesting one, especially for students uh, listening here. Um, and it is the fact that um, you know when the universe started, uh, we had uh, I mean the elements that were in the universe they were all hydrogen, helium with the, very with the traces of lithium so basically just hydrogen and, and helium so how we ended up with uh, the elements in the periodic table is thanks to massive stars so as we saw as we were you know i was just discussing the onion uh, structure of a massive star before it goes off a supernova so every you know it, it has basically inside the, uh it's bad like all, all the uh, you know, the, basically all the elements of the periodic table. So up to iron, uh, beyond iron, then they're produced in in uh, during the supernova explosion because they need energy. So and also mergers, <laughs> so actually compact object mergers. So that's an all separate uh, subject on its own. Uh, but the the basically, so the very interesting fact is that we would not be you know we would not be here today had it not been for these massive stars because they are creating all the uh, elements uh, above uh, above helium. So the, you know, basically, you know, as uh, Carl Sagan put it uh, once, uh, we're made of star stuff. So it's it's literally, it's not just a, a metaphorical um, uh, quote. It's it's a very it's a, a real one. So we're made of star stuff. So that's something again as an assigned to remember. Um, it's it's a very important fact. <laughs> where the elements that make our own bodies are coming from. So they were generated in these massive stars. So they're interesting for so many, uh, so many reasons. But as far as um, gravitational waves um, are concerned, uh, the interest is on the compact object that's left behind. So the envelope goes into space. And again, it's the one that um, leaves behind this, uh, the, the, <clears throat> you know, the, the <laughs> elements. <laughs> Uh, that then it reach the interstellar medium and the of stars and planets and so forth and human beings and planets. Um, but what we care for um, as far as gravitational waves are concerned is what happens to the to the core. So this iron core that's just collapsing on itself. And here again, um, it's so there is um, so there is a, se um, a, a separation. Uh, so two poss there are basically two possibilities as to what can happen which depends uh, fundamentally on one variable, which is the mass of this core, how massive it is. And where exactly this separation is, is not well known. And it's um, a problem on a, um, a question, so to speak, on its own. Um, and I'll, I'll tell actually that in a moment. So below a certain mass, and again, I will elaborate um, why it's not well known yet, uh, the object becomes a neutral star. So what is a neutral star? A neutral star is basically a, it's very an extremely dense uh, body, which is basically densities um, like nuclear densities. It's basically a giant core of neutrons with some fraction of, potron, po uh, of, of protons. But it's basically you can imagine as a giant ball of neutrons. It has in terms of mass. So the mass is about one point four solar masses. Uh, generally about one four, four, uh, about one point four. Uh, this is the, the marking line uh, between um, white dwarfs and um, and neutron stars. And um, and it, in terms of radii, uh, it has a typical radii a radius of around ten to twelve kilometers. So just imagine uh, the sun. Take another half of the sun and squeeze it in the size, you know, 10 kilometers, like, you know, Manhattan or something like that, actually much smaller even than Manhattan. Um, 
Stony Brook. <laughs> So it's uh, it's an extremely extremely dense uh, dense object, and in fact, it's the densest objects uh, other than black holes. Uh, so neutron stars are very interesting in their own, um, as you know, for their own radiation that they, they emit. <laughs> but again, we won't be discussing uh, that here. Um, but they are then very interesting uh, as source of gravitational waves, which we'll discuss in a moment. So these are neutron star. Now, as I was saying. Above a certain value, then not even um, this is like the interior is kept together against gravity by um, there is a combination of it's mostly nuclear forces, uh, but also um, neutron uh, degeneracy. So since the you know the details of nuclear forces at this extremely high densities um, so are not well known, uh, this is the reason for which the precise mass. Uh, or more density. So it's a combination between mass and radius, so compactness of neutron star is not well known. And it is one of the, um, you know, holy grail of, um, you know, astrophysics, but that's very much coupled to, uh, to nuclear physics because um, finding what is the precisely, you know, highest mass that a neutron star can have uh, in combination to its radius uh, gives us a lot of information on, on basically mat <coughs> matter at this, uh, nuclear density. This is basically like it has the density of the nucleus of an atom. So just to give you a sense, <clears throat> it's extremely, extremely dense. Um, and um, as an aside, because again, I won't be able to go too much into that <clears throat> later. Um, gravitational waves will also, you know, helping in that direction. So that's um, so. Just to keep in mind, it's one of the open questions that uh, also with gravitational waves we are trying to ag address. This, so to remember for. For later or for you know for the future um, in general when you hear more uh, future observations um, in that direction. So above a certain mass <laughs> um, to be determined uh, then not even um, there is no other force in nature that can uh, fight against gravity and the object becomes a black hole. So the a black hole is um, um, a question? Uh, it's, yeah go ahead. So the massive uh, angular, uh, sorry, magnetic field that comes in from neutron stars, what is the origin of that since it's made out of neutrons? Is it the accretion disk or spins of those uh, neutrons? What what brings? All right, all right, yeah, it's a very good question. So that's, I said it's made of neutrons, but I also added that because it's, a, uh, so there also, there is a fraction, there is also some protons inside. Uh, so there is also, there are also currents. Um, and the crust as, um, uh, so that it basically, yeah, the bottom line is that there is also, there is also a fraction of, uh, of protons. So that's, that keeps, uh, um, and there, so there are currents inside the, the, uh, the neutron star, which keep the magnetic fields. Now, the question is where they came from. Um, and this is um, an, another um, issue on its own. So stars that have magnetic fields. Um, to start with. And then what happens basically when, so the core of the star will have a certain magnetic field. And now when when the core collapses, it collapses by, I think it's about like six orders of magnitude in size uh, when it goes from iron to um, to to a neutron star. Uh, and then there is, you know, basic flux conservation. Uh, so as you're reducing, you know, B times say it's conserved. So basically the, the, the cross section. So, so basically as the, the, the object becomes much, much smaller, the magnetic field gets much larger. And that, that's basically how we end up with the magnetic fields in neutron stars. Um, they are, so typically neutron star will have 10 to 12, 10 to 13 Gauss, which is an enormous number, like nothing like we have seen anywhere, um, any close in any uh, magnetized objects, um, you know, on, on Earth or laboratory. Um, then there are some neutron stars that are called magnetars that have even higher magnetic field, like 10 to the 15 or so. And that's where they come from is a subject of investigation on its own. There might be early dynamo when the neutron star is still very fluid before, um, before uh, you know, when it's still basically yeah, like a fluid <laughs> uh, before it starts so, to solidifying. But yeah, so <laughs> that's the general. So there is some, there are currents inside and, uh, and magnetic fields came from the magnetic fields in the star after a huge compression. Other questions on the neutron stars? I mean, they are very interesting on their own right, that, you know, other than when they merge, which produce a lot more interesting features. Uh, and then, I mean, same for black holes. I mean, black holes are objects of, in, you know, very much 
interesting in uh, in their own right um and as you know they are they were mathematical solution of the theory of general relativity and uh, you know assessing their existence in reality uh, has been a huge um you know a huge endeavor i mean even einstein well, wasn't really keen at the beginning to um you know to believe the fact that this you know singularity of space time as they are basically in the theory of general relativity uh, would actually be real physical objects. So it's it's that it has taken quite a bit of um, of effort and observations uh, to actually assess that black holes do exist in nature. Um, as you know, actually, uh, the uh, even the um, Nobel Prize this year <laughs> was given for research on black holes, and uh, you know, two of the three people that got the Nobel Prize, they won it for um, for discovering the um, um, observations of the motion of stars, um, the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. So that's uh, so. But the point is that so it, it's been the research on black holes has been uh, really something where you know there was a lot of doubt whether these objects really exist for real, and even you know for the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way, because you know there are supermassive black hole at the center of, of each galaxy. And now they go there. It's it's an all interesting uh, story on its own. Uh, but assessing that, you know, the, like a lot of astronomers have fought the idea by, you know, make, you know, suggesting other possibilities, you know, concentration of other strange matter uh, that would not be visible, but, but you know, um, could still have similar dynamical effects. I mean, in the end, it's clear that no other uh, physically possible explanation can hold water. And, uh, and so we have those confirmed. But as far as the small masses, black hole, which are these ones, that resulted from the explosion of massive stars. These are very hard to detect in isolation. They're such impossible or almost impossible to detect in isolation because they're very small and um, and on their own, they will not emit any radiation. So they're, they're dark. Uh, they will emit radiation when they are um, surrounded by an accretion disk and the accretion disk <clears throat> um, as the as matter accretes some of its energy is released. So when we see a black hole bright, it's not brighter because it's coming radiation from the black hole, nothing can come, can come out from the black hole, uh, at least the classical, and there is Oking radiation, which is a separate story. Um, but, but it's basically radiation from the Christian disk. So some of this had been seen um, in uh, when, the, when they are with the companion star, when there is a companion star, material from the star uh, often, you know, gets stripped and forms an accretion disk around the black hole. So we have, we have had some evidence, dynamical evidence, because also when you have a binary, you can measure orbital parameters and then you can infer the mass of the object. And if it's too massive to be a neutron star, then, you know, then we have had suggest, okay, this ought to be a black hole, but it's only been with gravitational waves that black holes have been confirmed to exist in the way the generativity predicted basically as solution to the um, to the theory of general relativity. So there was a long introduction on, <laughs> on stars and the formation of compact objects. And uh, now, uh, if there are no further, are there questions, it will, then it will be just gravitational waves in a, in a nutshell. So you, that my talk will end up be mostly introduction, but <laughs> given uh, I'm explaining things in a lot of detail, um, but it's okay. Um, Okay, then I continue on. So gravitational waves. So, so let's uh, uh, now explain uh, what these are in in um, uh, in a nutshell again. So just uh, um, actually one step back um, on the theory of general relativity. So you know, theory of general relativity is the theory that described gravity. Um, that the, basically the most general theory of gravity. So prior to to Einstein, um, you know, we had Newtonian theory, uh, which describes you know, like gravity is, you know, as you know, is a force between two objects. The theory of general relativity re revised the, the whole uh, way of thinking and, and basically incorporates space and time as one unified uh, texture. And basically when masses do, masses create curvature in space time. So basically the way we describe a massive boat is like a curve in a curvature in space time. And the more massive an object is, the more it will curve space time. And then the motion of another object in, you know, within the gravitational field of, you know, let's say the previous one, it will be like a motion in a curved space time. So, so it's, uh, it's basically, you know, re re <laughs> rethinking the way we think about gravity and, um, and the um, Newtonian, um, Newtonian gravity still 
you know, it works in the weak field limited. So when your two objects are far, are very far, um, or you know, when basically, or they are not very massive. So basically, when the curvature of space time is not significant, uh, then uh, the theory of uh, Newtonian gravity works very well. However, when the you know when an object is very close or you know very massive, it's a combination of the two, and it also the how accurate the observation are, then the effects of the curved space time will be felt, and uh, and then the only way to describe the uh, the evolution of the system is via general relativity. And actually, as an aside. Uh, you're probably already familiar with that, but um, you know Mercury, which is the uh, closest planet to the Sun, had known um, had an anomaly in in its you know in its orbit that could not be explained you know by Newtonian gravity you know accounting for the perturbation of all the planets you know everything accurately um, you know put because it has all you know just around the Sun there was a you know discrepancy in the way its orbit um, was um, you know was going uh, and then you know you do very precise calculation, you know, again, add all the planets and see all the pools for all the other planets, how they disturb the orbit of Mercury, and still that could not match the observation. Um, it was basically thanks to the theory of general relativity that, you know, there's a perfect match between uh, observations and, um, and theory. So even, you know, in our solar system, actually, uh, there are cases where the theory of general relativity is needed to explain observations consistent with the, you know, resolution that we have in the data. Now, a case where um, what happens in you know extreme situation. Uh, so when two objects, so when we have so compact objects like neutron star and black holes are because they are so dense and so um, so compact, they are deeply influencing the space time around them. Now, when two objects merge, uh, or generally you know when there is when there is basic so actually let me go ahead, continue with that when two objects merge. What is happening is they're basically steering the space time around themselves. So you can imagine basically um, a gravitational wave as, you know, because as the two objects are far, space time will look, you know, like very far, like two holes around them. But then as they get closer to one another, they will be steering space time. And, and basically, and there is energy loss. And as the system spiraling together, so they get closer and closer, um, gravitational waves are basically the way in which energy uh, is radiated away by space time. Uh, so it's like, you know, loss of angular momentum basically, um, which is seen as, um, as a perturbation in space time, which, um, which is, I guess, generated by the two objects moving. So it's like steering uh, a pond uh, with two objects uh, going, you know, like going around one another. And then these waves propagate to us. It's you know like throwing a pebble in a pond is disturbing. You know the pond that was flat all, <laughs> and then it's changing. It's you know it's it's you know imagine that to be space time. It, there is a perturbation, and that perturbation propagates to us. Um, that's basically one you know the way to imagine uh, gravitational waves. So this is how uh, a more um, um, quantitative way uh, to see them. So um, just with the, a few more details, so again, predicted by the theory of general relativity and propagated the speed of light, carry away energy and angular momentum. And this is how the core, how a gravitational wave would, um, you know, gets to us. So let's, th this particular case is shown uh, in, this, um, in this representation is the one in which we have, uh, why the mouse is disappearing, uh, sorry. It's okay. Here we go. So when uh, when two uh, two masses are going around one another, so it's basically just it's a binary. Uh, so two two compact objects in a binary uh, going around in um, um, yeah in a circle motion. So it's a simple situation. So the way they affect space time, this is in three D, and this is a projection um, you know towards us. So if we had, um, so this is what happens in, you know, far away in the universe. And this is what we would see if we had, uh, uh, and it's highly uh, exaggerated <laughs> because the far away that the, these uh, are tiny, but we'll get to that later. So imagine that we have a number of tiny particles, which are basically test particles. So, so each, um, you know, sitting and every, um, in each corner of, uh, of this diagram, basically, if we were to observe those test particles as the gravitational wave is propagating to us, we would see them 
doing this series of contraction and uh, um, and this tank. So basically contracting one direction and the, and the other basically uh, what you see here. So it's, it's a series of uh, pulling and push of these particles. So, so this is something to be kept in mind for later. So this is how gravitational waves um, operate. Um, all right. Just a second, let me go to the next one. Um, also, as an, uh, um, just as an aside, but also as an important aside <laughs> before going to how we detect them, uh, is the fact that gravitational waves before being detected um, directly uh, by LAGO, which we'll describe in a moment, they were indirectly already um, already predicted and, um, and well, they were predicted, but they were already detected. Um, so how is that? So there was a system, a very famous one, which again uh, gave rise to another Nobel Prize in physics. Um, there was a very, there is still there, a very tight uh, binary, which um, right now is, is known as the Hulse-Taylor uh, binary pulsar from the, the two uh, Princeton physicists. Um, so these are two neutron star pulsars. They manifest themselves as pulsars. So the pulsar is a name often used for neutron stars. And they were in isolation. So if on their own, if there was no gravitational waves, you know, any considerable, like a, basically there would be no energy loss. There would just be a system of two objects gravitationally bound, uh, which are conserving angular momentum and energy, and they will stay like that forever. However, if there is a significant loss of gravitational waves, which is the case when you have, so the, the you know, the, the tighter is a binary, um, the more they steer space time, as you can imagine. So the closer they get, the more intense is the loss in, um, in gravitational waves. So this was well known because it was a very tight binary. So um, it was a very good candidate uh, for um, detection of basically indirect detection of gravitational waves. So, you know, people knew that if uh, gravitational waves were indeed emitted, then this pulsar would, the orbit of this pulsar would be shrinking in time. And here you see, so observation started in 1975 and the system up to some later times here. Uh, these are the dots, the dots are um, the observations. And this is the prediction of the theory of general relativity based on the parameters of this, the orbital parameters, this pulsar system, binary system. So it's, perfect, perfect uh, match between uh, the theory and the observation. So just uh, to keep in mind, um, also as we discuss more later um, uh, coming up of LIGO. Um, so, you know, physicists knew that gravitational waves existed. So it was only, it was only a matter of um, getting instruments um, sensitive enough for the direct detection. So, but already, I mean, this was extremely encouraging um, because you know the investment that went into the um, you know LIGO into the gravitational wave detector, it, you know it's also been you know spurred by the fact that um, there were, there had been already been indirect detection, so that's uh, um, very important to know. So the quest for direct detection, um, as uh, as you know, so came uh, you know like started maybe more than thirty years ago. Um, so the idea basically uses um, you know, two slides ago, that pattern, you know, if you have some test particles, um, the fact that they would have, you know, this like pushing and pulling perpendicular to one another. So if you remember, um, you know, some test particles. So this is basically the very, at the very core of um, the idea that, um, that triggered, um, you know, like the, build, the building of LIGO and Virgo. So, one, so LIGO and Virgo, uh, so there's two, two, two different ones in US and uh, Virgo is in Italy. Um, so first of all, why do we want multiple? Um, well, first of all, having more uh, makes any, any uh, signal um, you know, higher with the you know, detectable at a higher significance, but also, so this is an extremely, extremely sensitive um, uh, detection because the extent of that, you know, basically delta H, that delta, you know, difference in, in um, you know, the amplitude variation, which there was extremely exaggerated, just to give it a, the idea, for typical cosmological sources, you know, sources that we're, you know, hoping to see, you know, in our lifetime, because obviously if you wait, we wait long enough, eventually there will be, uh, you know, one very, very close, but astronomers were, 
and try to reach to reach sensitivity where we would have some non negligible rate. <laughs> so we could see a few, you know, a few per year as it started. So that was the idea. So for typical numbers that, you know, there'd been a lot of calculation to estimate where they were, basically the sensitivity delta H is something on the order like 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 23. So it's tiny, tiny, tiny. So that's basically, you know, the difference in that, in, in, in that uh, you know, extent of you know, squeezing and stretching in the two direction. So in order, you know, since that's, that's delta H over H, so basically in order to make as sensitive as possible in absolute numbers, one wants to build the, uh, the instrument as long as possible. So delta H in absolute number is the biggest. And then what is the idea? The idea behind is that of interferometry, basically sending, you know, like a Michelson interferometer is basically the same idea. So sending light pulses constantly, um, you know, in the two perpendicular directions. And then, um, you know, these two, these two are exactly the same. And this is where, you know, it's really amazing how, you know, the level of precision they have had to have uh, here. Um, and then basically record it when, whenever there is a gravitational wave um, coming in, then, you know, one, one side will get shorter, the other will become longer and they will alternate. And that will be seen with the uh, inter light interference for the pulses returning. So this is the very core of how uh, these instruments uh, work. And it's, uh, it's really amazing for the level of accuracy that was required to detect, to detect the gravitational waves um, that actually, you know, that they did the work um, after you know, 30 years, uh, but it's been, uh, it's been amazing. And as you know, also this, gave rise to uh, another Nobel Prize in uh, 2017. So these were the three people who actually had, um, you know, the original idea for, you know, for, for direct detection of gravitational waves. So they, they conceived that this, uh, um, you know, first the <laughs> pen and paper a long time uh, before and then construction began. So that's basically um, a gravitational wave in a nutshell. I'm also looking at the time. So let me just then, you know, I will just, I guess, just tell you um, since, you know, given the time, I will uh, um, basically tell you a little bit of what we expect in terms of uh, electromagnetic emission, just as a general um, introduction <laughs> uh, to that. And there will be, um, so that I, I keep with time. <laughs> so, so as I, as I mentioned before, um, so gravitational waves have been extremely interesting in their own right. Uh, however, um, they've also been even more interesting in connection with the electromagnetic radiation. So the question is, when do we expect it and what kind of radiation do we expect? Uh, so this is what I will, uh, um, so I will talk about this next and then, um, and then I guess I'll stop. Um, so first of all, if we have two black holes. So black holes are objects are basically just, you know, space-time curvature, uh, so to speak. And if there is no matter surrounding them, then when two black holes merge, the only thing that we expect uh, is, um, is uh, just a gravitational wave. So there is no electromagnetic uh, radiation expected. And however, here I should now I will mention since I won't get all the way uh, to the end of the talk with that. So I will mention it now. So there has been one recent event, which was uh, announced in, in May, but then the publications were actually came out in uh, was more like a month ago or something. So relatively recent, like early fall or late summer. Um, basically, there's been one uh, one case of merger of black holes where. Um, there has been um, there has been a, you know a, a non non insignificant uh, coincidence uh, with uh, um, with the, also an electromagnetic counterpart. Um, so for that particular case, uh, it appears that this um, uh, this uh, binary merger um, happening in a, in the disk of an active galactic nuclei. Active uh, galactic nuclei are basically galaxies which host a supermassive black hole, but supermassive black hole is being fed by a disk and therefore is very bright. So there is this, there are these accretion disks. This is in far away universe, so likely not our own galaxy. The supermassive black hole is very quiet or otherwise we would be burning. Uh, but in active galactic nuclei, so early on, the supermassive black hole were being fed at high rates and emitting a lot of radiation through accretion disks. 
So one of the latest LIGO um, events, this is part of the um, O3 run. So the latest, uh, the most recent um, run of, uh, of LIGO uh, basically um, had um, um, a massive black hole, uh, which um, and I mean, not only was more massive than any of the other that had been detected in the first two, two LIGO runs, but also um, and again, this counterpart, um, electromagnetic counterpart, which was um, um, interpreted as being gas accreting uh, and shocked within the disk of this active galactic nuclei. So there's been an interesting event in its own. Like Milago already has, you know, has led to so many um, variety of interesting events. Um, so let me. So, th but this is basically the situation with the binary black holes. So whenever binary black holes have a um, um, you know, an electromagnetic counterpart that, that raises, you know, a lot more questions uh, because they are not expected to have. So the environments have to be special. So something has to be very special and different for binary black holes. Now for neutron star binary, uh, let me actually go to the neutron star black hole since it's the, um, is the one which is the um, you know, next in terms of complications, so to speak. So for when a neutron star and black hole merge, um, what happens is that the neutron star is um, tad as it gets closer to the black hole, um, is, it is getting uh, tadally disruptive. Um, what happens next depends on whether the tidal disruption radius is outside of the radius of circularization, which is basically a radius in which matter can be in a stable orbit around the black hole. If that happens, then we end up with a black hole and an accretion disk. Uh, on the other hand, if um, if the tidal disruption radius is inside the um, the circularization mm -hmm. radius, then the neutron star just end up into a plunge into a black hole, and no electromagnetic radiation is expected. Because again, the electromagnetic radiation in astrophysics, when you have a black hole, the way to have radiation is basically the most you know the, the most straightforward way for nature. To get radiation out of a black hole is by creating onto uh, a black hole. So that's basically the, the bottom line. So this is the situation for neutron star black hole. And again, these are things I'm, I'm describing now because as you know, more and more uh, lag events that will happen over the years. So maybe then you, you, you know, whenever you hear something, you can connect to some of what I heard today. And then there is like the double neutron star uh, scenario where the number of situations can be, um, so there can be various scenarios and I'm just, without becoming too technical now, I'll just describe um, more or also given the time, describe more simply in, in words. Um, so if, you know, if, if there, the sum of the two is more massive than what any equation state can hold, it will end up into a black hole. And then depending on where, you know, the, you know, the conditions again in the mass outside of the, um, event horizon uh, when um, uh, when they become a black hole. So again, if uh, if uh, it's outside of the, the outside of the, if the circular radius is outside the tidal radius, and then we'll have uh, an accretion disk formed. And again, there will be a lot of energy released. Um, another possibility if uh, for the equation of state, state allows a very massive neutron star, so this is a very interesting case, um, two neutron star may also lead to, a, um, to a, um, a stable neutron star. So this is the, the panorama um, that, we, uh, that we have. And just another minute, uh, I will just describe, um, since this has been one very famous case, uh, which still remains the only one, so I'll just you know, it's been basically the most famous uh, of all the LIGO events. Uh, so it was basically a double neutron star, neutron star merger where um, there was in, 2000, in, uh, in um, 2017, which led also to discover electromagnetic radiation basic at all wavelengths. And, uh, and also to the confirmation that some uh, class of, um, of uh, explosions that we were seeing in universe, they are called short gamma bursts, that which were suspected to be a double neutron star mergers, but they were not proven to be such. Um, now, basically, a short gamma burst that was seen coincident with uh, uh, a binary neutron star merger in gravitational waves, and they also so they solved the the problem of what uh, um, you know what the short gamma burst was as another. So I'll just uh, um, basically show this as a last. Uh, uh, so this is what happens as the NASA rendering of what happens as two neutron star merge, um, as we see here. So 
there is a huge explosion. A lot of matter is accretes onto the newly formed black holes and then um, a jet. Let me see if I can go back slowly on the, or I can, I can, yeah, I can actually have it slowly guide it. Um, so the two are getting closer. There's tidal disruption in the center parts, as you see here. So they get closer and closer. You see some exposing events here, which is basically when um, the center becomes a black hole. And then this is the, uh, the explosion and the often there is um, jets that are being produced as a, a, the black hole accretes from an accretion disk. And if we are lucky or unlucky as you wish it to be a long year ago, it was very quick before. So, um, so if we are uh, called as kilonova. Right. So this is okay. So the kilo. So <laughs> it's one of the images. So this is the short gamma burst. So then uh, let me just say uh, now this in words. So there are other things that also happen. So during the this merger of this, um, so there is a huge amount of energy, and that goes into producing uh, very um, uh, so some of these like um, uh, very heavy elements, which then decay. And this is the kilonova. So the kilonova is basically um, it's basically you know rising from um, it's in, I mean it's infrared radiation, but it's basically um, you know, the process by the by the very dense layers of um, you know initial gamma rays uh, that are being uh, produced as uh, very heavy nuclei are produced, and this is because it, as I mentioned early on. So let's connect to that. In the you know in supernova, we only produce up to iron because that's through fusion. Um, however, you know we know that we have other elements. You know, very heavy elements like gold, <laughs> for one example. Um, and platinum, which are uh, um, which are heavier than than uh, the iron. So the, there's always been the question: where are those produced? And there were some ideas. Actually, I should uh, mention that uh, the very first paper suggested that uh, uh, a binary merger could be responsible. It was uh, written by it was uh, Professor Jim Latimer, Stony Brook, um, who, who suggested it was his PhD thesis with his advisor. I was basically on suggesting on this idea that um, in the enormous, um, um, you know, in this uh, very extremely strong explosions um, where a lot of energy is, is released, is for, you know, you have a lot of energy available. Uh, some of these um, heavier than iron elements could be produced, and then so the kilonova is basically what we see as a result of the you know these el heavy elements being produced. And then the energy cascades down and gets reprocessed. Um, so it's a spectrum of these lanthanides, which are you know very, very, very you know very heavy elements in the periodic table. They're reprocessing radiation. So we see we see that um, you know they go they get down scatter all the way to the infrared. Uh, so that's the kilonova. So it, it was uh, this particular you know the, so there will be one case uh, so far um, uh, in 2017 where we have seen you know. This that I'm showing here, this is just a rendering, but basically we saw all the radiation that we expect from such, a, you know, this, this is the short gamma burst. But in addition, we saw also the kilonova, which was basically confirmed the fact um, that, uh, um, that the, you know, these mergers are certainly, if not the dominant, are certainly a very important uh, place for, uh, for the production of these very heavy elements, so including gold and, <laughs> And platinum and, and so forth. And I stop here as it's just five, so it actually went even a bit longer, but there were some questions throughout. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop here with the... If you have anything to, you can take five more minutes if you have. Yeah, it's, it's actually, um, so it, um, I, I mean, the other, you know, then it was, it, it would be, it would have become a little bit more um, technical. But since you had asked me, let me go forward, forward that much. In, you'd ask me about also some of the recent. Uh, um, just to give a bit of you know like how this is revolutionizing our understanding. So um, so so this yeah I mean I, I worked a lot on this uh, um, you know this neutron star uh, binary neutron star merger, but then again it gets a little bit more technical. So I will skip that. However, I will mention um, since you were asking about recent results as when we when we uh, corresponded. Uh, so these are some of the uh, surprises from the O3 runs. And by the way, you know the the O3 um, run the paper, the official papers uh, just came out last week. And then I was just uh, before, 
So just as we were starting, I was just finishing listening the gravitational wave group meeting at, uh, at the, the Flatiron where they were giving a summary of the three, uh, the three results. But some of the, so, you know, the, the catalog paper just came out basically like a, a few days ago. Uh, but some of the interesting cases, uh, they were published, you know, their, their own, um, their own uh, paper. And these are two of those. So maybe I can mention those uh, just to, again to give a bit of a sense of how revolutionary is this, um, this uh, have been. Um, like, you know, so th the theory of like stellar evolution predicts uh, black holes to be up to certain um, maximum mass, so to speak. And this particular value is not well known, but you know, it is believed that above a certain point, basically stars will explode, that they will undergo an instability. Um, it's called pulsation instability, and they basically will um, appear in stability um, and also pulsation in other some cases. Uh, it, it, it basically, they will explode without leaving behind any black hole. And that was like the general understanding. However, uh, so during the O3 run, uh, and this was in May announced, uh, so there has been a discovery of, um, of uh, a black hole, which is more massive than what um, stellar theory would predict. Uh, so basically it's in a place that which was not expected. So there's, I mean, this event on its own, which you see here, so these are all the previous events. Um, and this one here on its own has already generated so much literature. So it's, you know, it's still unclear whether it was produced as a, the end state of massive stars or whether, um, you know, these black holes were in turn second generation, so to speak, in, in, in the sense they were formed by mergers of pre previous black holes. So that's, um, that's one, one interesting event. Another event, because, um, so, you know, we know neutral stars, this is again pre-ligum, um, all the, you know, no neutral star and their masses that be measured. And then there were, you know, all the black holes which, whose masses had been measured when they are with the binary. I, I mentioned that uh, at some point in the, early on, how uh, we, you know, small black holes with a star accreting, you know, that's how we have been measured some masses of black holes prior to LIGO. And then there appeared to be a gap <laughs> between the, you know, maximum mass of neutron star and the minimum mass of black holes that we had detected. Whether the gap was real statistic has always been a subject discussion, but then there were a lot of theory paper that actually had interpreted this gap as being real, um, you know, and, uh, <laughs> made, you know, come up with some, some ideas as to why there should be gap. But now you know it's been interesting. Uh, so one of these, um, one of these, uh, um, you know, merger had actually a black hole in the mass gap. So that's yet you know is now is giving some rethinking about the stellar evolution and so forth. So it's uh, it's basically it's an area where um, there is a lot of exciting stuff um, uh, coming up. <laughs> so it's it's uh, yeah it, and and again it's it's going in with LIGO now. Uh, going through new runs, um, uh, you know, always at um, you know at a higher resolution, higher sensitivity. So we'll have more and more. So, but that's yeah, how, it's plenty. Okay, so that was you know one of the recent ones. Um, and now, uh, yeah, I will stop <laughs> with this. So, take any questions. Okay. Already over time. Yeah, no, it's okay. So, thanks a lot, Rosalba, for a wonderful of course, talk. It is, uh, my pleasure. Okay, so I will. Uh... I have a couple of questions, but if I, if anybody has questions for Rosalba. Um, just, uh, just very interesting that, uh, that this particular run, uh, sort of had a had an intermediate mass black hole yeah, that's right, yeah that's the... especially, especially, you know, with the, with the recent discovery made of, uh, intermediate mass black holes. So that's right. I'm yeah. just uh, I'm just uh, wondering if there are any sort of theoretical attunements that are in place, like in in the motion right now, given given this new expose of this particular type of black hole. Yeah. So basically, so so there are a lot of papers being written as we speak, as a matter of fact, uh, and they're mostly uh, trying to you know to explain um, how this black hole could have happened. So there have already been some theory. Um, Suggest so. I mean, the more massive one, which is 142, which is you know post uh, post merger. Um, so that you know, I mean, they came from the merger. So the ones that are hard to explain are you know the two components. One is 65, the other is 85. So the 85 one is the one that is the tricky one. So there have already been some papers trying to have modified um, 
star models where maybe you know some stars merge and then therefore their core is much larger than you know would normally be on a normal single isolated uh, star evolution. Uh, so people who do st stellar evolution, this is often the case. I mean, I guess in every um, in every field, but in astrophysics in particular. So there have been, generally speaking, two two groups. That, like you know, like so the people that basically are interpreting the merger with the stellar evolution, standard evolution. So you know, two stars that start in binary, and then they will um, mer you know they will go through evolution, remain in binary, and then die as binaries. And then there is the other uh, group, which is the dynamical groups, where you have stars that are isolated, so they, they you know, end up going off as a supernova and forming compact objects independent. And they, and then they, those um, through dynamical interaction they will form a binary. Now, for this particular one, um, so there has been again <laughs> both groups uh, proposing uh, proposing model. The harder one was the, um, you know, is the stellar evolution one. Um, because it's less, um, you know, it, it, is a, it is requiring some um, fine tuning <laughs> uh, of, of uh, you know, like one paper, for example, you know, showed that what the, this maximum mass is is a function of uh, some rates, some nuclear reaction rates, which are uncertain and, and so forth. Um, on the dynamical point, it's they're relatively easier. It just, it's a matter of rates because you're basically, you know, you make a, a bigger black hole by just merging two smaller ones. So it, it's, uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's um, very much in um, you know <laughs> there's already been a lot going on and it's unsettled as of yet. If it did happen, this particular one in a, in the disk of an AGN, uh, as it seems, you know there is like a probability, like high probability, then a likely channel will be the the, the dynamical one because in in AGN disk there is a lot of uh, potential for interactions and forming binaries. Okay, so Joel, go ahead and ask your question. <laughs> yeah, the question is, can a black hole live inside a neutron star? If a black hole lives inside a neutron star, um, uh, no. <laughs> so how is the, the, the very, it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, so how is it the very interior of a neutron star? So that's something where we don't know exactly if it just, um, you know, protons, uh, neutrons and protons, and then what time, what type of other particles are produced. Uh, but it's still, um, it's, it's still, um, it's still some matter at very high densities. So a black hole is not, um, you know, will only form as a global um, object during the collapse. Basically, when the old, you know, when the old core um, will cannot sustain, and then it, you know, uh, cannot sustain. Um, in, uh, you know, can, cannot be sustained by other forces, and then the entire thing will collapse. So that's how basically uh, it happens. But yeah, it is an interesting question. The, you know, the truth is that the very center of neutron star is the the part that we know the least. We know quite a bit about the you know the crust, for example, neutron star, the other parts. Um, but but the, the very the innermost part is the most obscure. So who knows? Maybe it could be. We'll discover at some point. So any further questions? So I have a couple of questions. So in the sense that, so ever since LIGO came online, so is there, uh, is there a possibility that uh, means you can map out uh, like radially outward space, like sitting from Earth that how, what is the density of each okay. types of black holes that are available to yeah. us? And so will LIGO be able to eventually map out the neighborhood of what kind of black holes there and for example i would say that let's say there are like super massive black holes okay, yeah. uh, that can also uh, collide and it's of right. course it depends on how frequent or rare these mm -hmm. events are so in the sense that yeah. uh, in some sense we if there is a sense of what is the traffic around <laughs> yes yeah, so, the kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. so is, is that something lego will be able to achieve like once it runs for let's say right. 30 40 50 Right, yeah, right. So LIGO has a very, so there's something where it can improve on. Um, so it has uh, the sensitivity which LIGO has. So we can, you know, we'll go down and down and down in, in, in sensitivity. So that's the H over H, so how far we can go. But what cannot change uh, because, it, you know, it's, it's related to how it is built is the, the frequency range. So LIGO is very sensitive to, you know, to black holes, basically to neutron stars, to black holes up to the you know, intermediate mass black hole range. 
But then as we go to more massive, so the super massive black hole, for example, they're not for LIGO. So they will be for like uh, Lisa and, and uh, right now there is, um, there is actually, it's, it's, it's a very different type of uh, um, experiment going on the pulsar timing arrays, which basically they use, you know, they use pulsars uh, to basically, um, to, so they're sensitive to gravitational waves from um, giant black holes merging. So it won't be LIGO. So LIGO will go more sensitive, but it will always be remain sensitive to the same type of black holes, which are this, you know, stellar mass black holes. And it was, I mean, it was designed- More massive, it may be more, uh, the signal is reduced. Yeah, it is, uh, right, but the frequency, the thing is that the more massive are, so, you know, the, fr the frequency of, um, so it's a much slower frequency. So the, you know, like, yeah, yeah, basically. So that, that's the thing. So it would be so the, the frequency is off the range. Uh, I may have actually, I think, some slide uh, among the extra slide that some with LIGO. I think I have it here. Uh, so it shows like basically, you know, like this is where LIGO. So you know, it goes down and down. But then once you're out of the frequency range, you're just you know like basically the noise you know shoots up. So it won't be mm -hmm. able. You know, supermassive black holes are out of LIGO, uh, but they are. You know, PTAs is basically it's more sensitive. It's it's a global noise. It's not as much sensitive to individual uh, mergers as yet, um, but it, it is. It has a sensitivity to the super to the background from supermassive black hole mergers, so which there are plenty actually. So, I um, mean, that's how you know we believe we assemble the supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies, partly through mergers over cosmic time of the smaller mass black holes. So, so yeah, it's a very interesting question. So the idea is basically now with, you know, between LIGO, PTAs, and then, uh, you know, LISA, which is uh, in uh, planned uh, for 2030 or so. <laughs> it's like a, a space interferometer. So it's like, you know, different, right. levels, like much, much larger branches, like um, mm -hmm. arms. And then we'll be able mm -hmm. to go to very different range of, of frequencies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is one more question from Neil Rupp. Go ahead and ask your question. So uh, I was uh, just uh, wondering uh, if there's a, if a stage uh, where um, the intermediate between a neutron star and a black hole, like a, a, any kind of quark degenerate matter that, that is uh, known about or experimentally verified or any, I mean, well, they wouldn't yeah. be able to experimentally verified, but uh... yeah, yeah. So this are the, I mean, there, there is at least, I mean, there have been a lot of theory papers written on basically quark stars, uh, indeed. So, um, so there are, so it is possible. So, so far, there has not been any proof of a quark star uh, as to date, uh, but it is a possibility, indeed, that, that it could still exist. So, quark, quark stars. There is not just a quark, but they have, they have their own. Uh, uh, they are in uh, big literature, so they are known, at least in theory, to exist, and uh, and they will have their own uh, uh, features when you know if they merge. So so yeah, so there is a possibility there to detect uh, quark stars if they do exist, and they are again th theoretically they they have been <laughs> predicted and they have a, a big literature. So it's All an right. interesting question indeed, yeah. So yeah, gravitational waves are really opening like a world on so many levels in terms of what we, um, you know, we're learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Rosalba again for a wonderful colloquium. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so thanks a lot, Rosalba. For okay, it's my so pleasure. Well. Um, yeah, it was it was like a very uh, right level talk for the students. All right, because <laughs> I was yeah I was sure. So I, I spent a lot of time on introduction more than normal. Well, that's perfect actually uh, because yeah. if they walk away from all this big picture, it is right. Right. So I figured yeah right. So that was more important to discuss the specific yeah. details of that. Yeah. Okay. So thanks a lot again. Right, you're and, very uh, welcome. <laughs> bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. bye. Stop sharing you.